the kids who are going to children's ministry, you can be dismissed right now. The rest of us invite you to turn in your copy of God's holy and inerrant word to John chapter 12. We're going to finish this chapter this morning. And this chapter ending, uh, as we've moved through John, this is actually a really significant point in the book of John. So the first 12 chapters of the book are called the book of signs. Because this is, that's the 12 chapters where, where Christ does all of his miracles, all of the signs that he is who he says that he is. And then chapters 13 through 21 are the, is called the book of passion. This is his passion on the cross, we'll see. And then the, and it's, it's a, a, a zoomed-in lens on the hours beforehand, before the actual cross. So we're hitting the, the actual halfway point, even though it's not uh, numerically halfway, that this is the, the, the way the book is split by the Holy Spirit through John as the author. And this, this section that we're looking at here, verses 44 through 50, is, it functions as a summary of Jesus' ministry. Now, John, we know, as we've been looking through this book, has a real lack of concern for chronology, not really concerned about things happening in the order that it happens. That wasn't what he's done. That's already been done three times, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very committed to that. John's taking a completely different perspective, understanding and assuming that everybody's going to have read those three first before he gets to his, because he writes after they do. So this saying of Jesus, in verses 44 through 50, is not, it didn't happen at this moment in time. Remember, John's not concerned with that. He's after a thematic versus a chronological ordering. So Jesus certainly said this, but we don't know when he said it. John uses this as a summary, a bookend, a way to button up this, this half of the gospel that he's writing. So it's intentionally placed here. Jesus is done speaking publicly, and John has commented on the general results of his public ministry. And well, now what the Spirit's going to do by inserting this here is give Jesus a summary of his public ministry. Now in this summary, we're going to find several things, uh, the chief of which is Jesus's oneness with the Father. But that's a central theme, a central element to this passage, as it has been throughout all of John's gospel so far and will continue to be. There's also the gospel explained and offered. The power and the authority of the word is going to be pulled out. The purpose of the first coming, the first advent, that's a part of this summary as well. Jesus is doing, uh, or rather inventing, the old adage that you got taught in speech class 101. How do they tell you to structure your speech? tell them, and then tell them what you told them, right? You just say that, all right, and when you're in doubt and you're struggling, it's the end of the week and you got a sermon coming up, then that's the structure you go with. Here's what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and then I'll tell you what I told you. Now that's what's happening right here. Nothing that is in this paragraph is going to be new. It's all been said before, and, and every commentary that I read, uh, they, all the commentaries were like, oh, we've already commented on this, just go back and read these passages. <laughs> And I was like, come on, like, give me some fresh stuff. But now they were like saving paper. But he's, sat, he's not saying anything new. This is a concentrated review of everything that Jesus has done publicly because we know now it turns to private. From 13 onward until he's actually crucified in chapters 18 and 19, he stays with just the disciples. That's it. That's what chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 are all about. So this is the end of the public ministry, and Jesus is going to summarize it himself. These are his own words, not John's commentary. We saw John's commentary last week. This is Jesus' exact words. So let's look at this first section. We're going to see the gospel offered in verses 44 through 46. Let me read these. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Now we see the first thing that it says in verse 44, and Jesus cried out. It's the Greek word kratzo. It's a, a guttural, 
raucous sound. It's elsewhere used, that same kind of word, it's elsewhere used in the scripture and in other ancient Greek writings to describe uh, the vocalities, we'll call them, of childbirth or, or war cries. I mean, this is a desperate, pleading, emotional crying out. And Jesus has done this four other times in the Gospels. Two other times are in Matthew and Mark on the cross. And then here, he's, we've seen it in this place. And then also when Jesus is calling out Lazarus from the tomb, he cries out. And in the other place was in John chapter 7 when he's crying out to the people to come to him as a living water. This is an emotional cry out. And he says in verse 44, whoever believes in me. Now we know that the word, if you go all the way back to when we started the Gospel of John, the word belief is critical to the book. And I don't know if you've been keeping count, but up until this verse, so from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 12, verse 43, before we get into our section, the word believe has appeared 72 times. 72 times in 12 chapters. What is John after? I mean, it has to be obvious to us. This is the priority. John's emphasizing what Jesus came to emphasize. Believe. Remember that the theme verse for all of John is John 20, verse 31. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He's saying, this is why I wrote the book, to believe. And so Jesus is now summarizing his public ministry with that word. And it says, whoever believes. We talked about that with John 3, 16, right? You can't not talk about that. And especially if you've got an old King James memorized, which we all do, it's whosoever even. Whosoever. So who is this belief for? Whoever. Every single person who believes, in verse 44, believes not just in me, but in him who sent me, in the Father. That this belief, every single believer on Christ, does not remain in darkness as we see in verse 46, but comes into the light. Whoever believes in me may not, will not, cannot remain in darkness. And this is really as simple as John is making it. We have to consider the providence of God in writing the scriptures that the, the, the book that's the most openly evangelistic, that this is a biography of propaganda, trying to make you come away believing and thinking in a certain way, that he does that through the author who uses the most simple language. John is the most simple language in the Greek and in the English. It's the easiest to understand. And his emphasis is believe. It really is that simple. And our confidence is not in the strength of faith, but what does it say? The object of faith. Whoever believes in me believes not only in me, but in him who sent me. Our confidence is not, we don't, have a, we don't have a belief in believing. We don't have a faith in faith. And we, that, we see that terminology thrown all around everywhere. I mean, if you, I'm pretty sure if you still go to SeaWorld in San Antonio, they have a show with the killer whales or the orcas. Like, we can't call them killer whales anymore. Um, the orcas. And the show is called Believe. And it's just, you know, inspirational. On the, on the video, is a kid walking around on the beach with a weird stick. And he's supposed to be a part of the show. And it's Believe. But believe in what? Believe, just, just believe. In what? Just have faith. In who? The object of our faith is what saves us. And faith has no intrinsic value. Just ask any Rangers fan. <laughs> I believed for almost the whole season. Now we'll turn it around. We're going to make it. But I had my faith in an object that was not worthy of my faith. It doesn't have any intrinsic value, only in the object of faith. Faith is effectual because it has a source and an object, and both of those are the triune God of the universe. That he is the source of our faith and is the object of our faith. He gives us faith, and he's where we put our faith. And what he has done cannot be undone. His promises cannot be broken. His will cannot be thwarted. Verse 30, 46 is authoritative. I have come into the world as light so that in order and because of whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness, cannot remain 
and darkness. And if you're seeing me, Jesus says in verse 45, if you're seeing me, meaning if you're understanding me, you're comprehending me, you're interacting with me, then you're doing all of that with the Father. That's where the hope ultimately lies. That's how we can be sure that whatever we are believing in cannot be thwarted because it's not just coming from a, the latest, greatest prophet that the world has seen up to this point. It's coming from the very creator of the universe. This belief is connected to the Father, verse 44 and verse 45. When we see Jesus, we see the Father. See, you know, oftentimes, I don't know if you do, we do this consciously, we probably don't, but oftentimes what we do is we divide the Trinity, at least in his will, and we picture Jesus and the Father kind of different from each other on the level of will or, um, or impetus. What we do is we be like, well, Jesus is kind of like our mom and God the Father is just kind of like the dad. Mom is soft and warm and caring and dad is hard and strict and strong. So like when your mom evaluates your mowing of the yard as a kid, <laughs> mom says, you just worked so hard, didn't you? And dad says, did you have a blindfold on? <laughs> Look at all the spots you missed. When you bring a report card to mom, she's like, look, all your grades are going up. And your dad says, why wasn't this 89 and 90? What could you have done to make it a 90 and get an A? And we think that, that, that that's how Jesus and the Father work. And we function like that interpersonally with each other in the church, but also individually as we pray and we understand the God of all creation and the God of all salvation. That... Well, Jesus wants us to be saved, and we aren't sure about the Father. And, and we look to Jesus when we're needy, and we assume the Father's disdain when we fail. But what is Jesus communicating here in these three verses? And we'll see again here at the end. Whoever believes in me believes not in only in me, is what, it's, what it was emphasizing there, but in him who sent me, in the Father. If you see me, you interact with me, you come to me, you're coming to the Father, verse 45, verse 46. That's the message that I have, that this is one with the Father. He's perfectly representing the Father. The Father isn't looking to take away what Jesus gave you. So often we think like that. Mom gave me this thing, but if I misuse it, Dad's going to take it away from me. And then I'm going to have to go to Mom to convince Dad to give it back. Or let me have it. Jesus is saying, that's, that's a farce. Jesus gave you salvation from the Father. It's his. And in the, the eternal covenant called the covenant of redemption, the, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit make a covenant together to just divvy up the roles of how it's going to come about. But it's all one plan. Jesus is described in verse or chapter 1, verse 3 of Hebrews, as this, it says that he is the radiance of the glory of God. And here's the, the emphasis, the exact imprint of his nature. The exact imprint of his nature. Humans are made in the image of God. Jesus is the image of God because only the thing can image itself, be the image of itself. That's what Jesus is. He perfectly represents him because he perfectly is him. And this is where the free offer of the gospel comes from. In these first three verses of Jesus' summary of his own ministry, this is where the offer of the gospel comes from. And it is a free offer of the gospel. John, of, of all the, the, uh, the gospel writers of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics, and John, John is the most openly and clearly uh, explaining the doctrines of grace or what we would see as election or predestination. John has it the most. You can't get around chapter 6. You can't get around chapter any of the chapters. But chapter 6 is so plain and so obvious. Chapter 17, it's all throughout. He's so clear about this. But he's also the most evangelistic of the four. So that we see here in, in uh, summarizing Jesus' own ministry, that what he can't do is say that, well, if you believe in the doctrine of election, that it inhibits your evangelism. 
Whereas what John keeps saying is that, no, believing in the doctrine of election demands my evangelism because he just keeps offering the gospel. You throw the seed of the gospel. We do, John is doing, everywhere indiscriminately. You know the parable of the sower, where the seed goes on to the rocky soil, to the path, to the good soil, to the soil with, with weeds in it? Imagine yourself being a first century farmer, and you live or die based on where your crops grow, and if they grow at all. Now, if you live in that world, and you live in an agrarian world, do you take your precious bag of seed, which is your future food and or money, and do you go, ah, I don't care where I throw it. I'll throw it on the path. I know I didn't plow right there, but I'm still going to throw it there. No, what's the, what's the illustration supposed to show us? That Jesus says that the seed is the word, it's the gospel, it's the message of salvation. So you throw it everywhere, indiscriminately. We don't go, well, I might give you the gospel, but let me hear a little bit about you first so that I might know that it will take root in you. No, the illustration is throw it everywhere. That's what Jesus keeps doing constantly throughout this gospel of John. And John's the one who's most clearly saying that no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. So this free offer of the gospel in no way contradicts with the understanding of the doctrines of grace. Jesus has promised that he is gathering sheep from every corner of the world. He said that in John 10. And they, he will call them out, they will hear his voice, and they will come. So Jesus summarizes this first element with the free offer of the gospel coming from him and from the Father. But we're not done with that aspect. Now the second emphasis that he brings in this summary of his own ministry is a response to the gospel in verses 47 and 48. So we know what happens to those, according to verse 46, who respond to Jesus, who hear his message and believe it. They believe in him. You know what happens to them? They don't remain in darkness. They come into the light, which John has been using metaphorically as coming out of sin and death and into new life in Christ that goes for eternity. But what happens to those who don't accept the gospel? Verse 47, Jesus says, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Often what we do, or how we think, maybe it's how we've been trained to think in just big evangelicalism, is we would like to find a gospel or a way to talk about the gospel that's offered like all the time to everywhere, to everyone, but has no consequence for those who don't take advantage of it. It's an offer. It's like getting a mailer, or it's like walking through the mall or Sam's or Costco by the kiosks of somebody trying to get you to upgrade your phone plan or your cable or get a new electronic fence for your dog. And, th and you say, no, that's okay. My life's not affected in any way. That offer was an amazing deal. The, the fence can't be penetrated by any dog or any squirrel. Like you, can't, you can't beat it. Or this phone plan is unbelievable. You're going to you know, travel all over the world and never have to pay a dime. Or this, you get a five million channels that you'll never watch, but you have them all there, and it's for 20 bucks a month. That, the, the deal is amazing. Nobody's denying that, but I just don't want it. So then my life just continues on like normal. But that's not what Jesus says is happening or real about the gospel. He says to the rejectors, if anyone hears my word and does not keep them, so you hear my words, I've been preaching to you, and you, you don't want it. He says, I don't judge you right now. I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world the first time. But there is, to the one who rejects me, and doesn't receive my words, there is a judge for that person, and it is the words that I've spoken. That's the judge. Jesus came the first time to make salvation effectual. That all the saints that have died in faith beforehand needed a once-for-all payment. So Jesus comes and he dies, and then that makes that payment for all of them. You think of Abraham, you think of Ruth, you think of Esther, you think of David and Solomon all the way back. Jesus pays for that, and then now everybody else who believes is saved on debit. They were saved on credit. We're saved on debit. So he makes salvation effectual. The once-for-all atonement has happened. He didn't come as judge the first time. 
He didn't come as judge. He came only as the Savior. And he enacts really no divine uh, authority, ju judgmental authority over sinners at all his first time. He just, in fact, he lets wicked sinners wrongfully kidnap him, wrongfully try him, wrongfully imprison him, beat him, and then execute him. He lets them do that to him this first time. He came as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We already saw this in John 3, 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So we see that. Jesus didn't come the first time to judge. But Jesus, before we go too far away from this, we need to be sure we understand something. That Jesus did not come in judgment at Christmas, but he is coming at judgment on the last day. He's, John's already said this. Jesus has already said this in John. John 5, 22. For as the Father judges no one, for the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. And then verse 27, same chapter. He has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. And same chapter, verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And then John also records in Revelation 6, 15 and following about Jesus. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountain, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who's seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They want mountains, get, cover me so that I can't be seen or found out. By who? The Lamb who has wrath. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? 2 Timothy 4.1 says that Jesus is the judge of the quick and the dead. Matthew 25, Jesus says the Son of Man will come on the last day and separate the sheep from the goats. Nevertheless, that judgment is future. That's not what happened this time that we're looking at right now. All for now, all Jesus does is save until that day comes. In verse 48, Jesus offers this warning. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. He's saying, don't think that because you're not being judged right now, or this is not happening right now, that it's never going to happen. Don't be lured into that way of thinking as if you'll never be judged. Psalms teach us this through an example. Psalm 10 three and following for the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord in the pride of his face the wicked does not seek him and all his thoughts are there is no God his ways prosper at all times your judgments are on high and out of his sight as for all his foes he puffs at them he says in his heart I shall not be moved throughout all generations I shall not meet adversity his mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and depression and under his tongue are mischief and iniquity and you skip down to verse 11 through 15 he says in his heart the same wicked man God has forgotten he has hidden his face he will never see it I'm not being judged right now that leads me to conclude I'll never be judged in verse 12 the psalmist says arise O Lord O God lift up your hand forget not the afflicted why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. Jesus is saying right along with David, don't think that just because it's not happening now that it's never going to happen. Psalm 94, 7 through 11, it says something similar. And they say, meaning these, these wicked people thinking along these lines, the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob does not perceive. And the psalmist pleads with them, understand, O dullest of the people. Fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are but a breath. This warning is real that Jesus is giving. This is going to happen. There is a judge. 
the word that I've spoken. There's a final day for every individual and for the whole universe. And on that day, there will be judgment. And the most decisive piece of evidence will be the gospel. That will be the decisive piece of evidence at your trial and at my trial. Did you receive it or did you not? See, all of human life and existence boils down to one question. Who do you say that the Son of Man is? This is the very question that Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew 16, 13 and following. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? This is Jesus' teaching moment. I'm going to just throw it out there to every, like, what's the hubbub about me, guys? Like, what are people talking about? What are they, who do they say that I am? What's their, what's their consensus? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus goes, oh, okay, cool. Thanks for the news. And now he turns to them. But who do you say that I am? That's the question that defines all of human existence. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Islam, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses all affirm Jesus is a prophet. Man, he knew his Bible. He knew his stuff. He spoke with impact and power. Hinduism and Buddhism say that, yes, he's a reincarnated guru. Had a lot of great things to say. Lump it all in with the other stuff that we've got to say. Historians will say, undoubtedly, he's an impactful leader. Undoubtedly, his presence affects the course of history. Civil rights leaders will minimize him to just being merely the first nonviolent protester that we should emulate. But ultimately, the question will come to you. It will not be, who do, you, who do they say that I am? It will be, who do you say that I am? And you'll have to answer, who do you say that he is? There's only one right answer. There's only one way to respond to the gospel that offers you and affords you the blessing of being affirmed by the Father of all creation and received into his presence. That question is what we must reckon with now, before the end. And that question is, how will I be judged by the words of Jesus? Because that's what he says is going to happen. There is a judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. What will the words of Jesus say? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or be gone from me, I never knew you. And summarizing his ministry, his own ministry, Jesus doesn't dull the edge of the gospel message. And so we mustn't either. We can't. We don't have the freedom to do that. This is not ours to edit. This is not a living document that we can go in and, like, let's get a digital version and just delete some of that stuff. Or be like Thomas Jefferson and take a pen knife and just cut out, literally, from a paper Bible, the things you don't like. We don't have the freedom to edit the message. It's God's and it comes by his authority. It's a message of sober warning that Hebrews 12, 25 summarizes well. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, meaning Jesus on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Same one, warning from both places. But Jesus doesn't end there because that's not the end of the message. The end of the message is not there is a judgment. The end of the message is that you can be saved. That's the source of the gospel. Verses 49 and 50. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who has sent me has, give, has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Jesus didn't come his own agenda and he's committed to not editing God and so should we be this gospel message is not an innovation that Jesus is saying right here Jesus is not saying something different than God did in the Old Testament there 
when, when theological liberalism was coming through the Western civilization church uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and evolution pops up in 1859 as a codified resource in The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, then they got to start thinking, we got to figure out how to deal with this. We really don't want there to be a God, but we have a God so far. We can't explain all of this away. So uh, here's what we can say. We can look at the God of the Bible evolving. He starts out angry and impetuous and, you know, childish and rage fits and rules and all that stuff in the Old Testament. But then by the time you get to the New Testament, he's matured. He's grown. Now he's, he's off of that law stuff and he's on to grace and acceptance. And so God has progressed along with history. What a wonderful way to ruin the Bible, but nevertheless make it fit with your ideology. It's a thinly veiled way to divide the Trinity and distort the gospel and to undermine the inerrant, infallible word of God. I just say, ah, it's changed over time, and God has changed over time. But Jesus says in verses 49 and 50, I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father's authority. And what we were wrong to see is to go, well, there's Jesus in the Old Testament, God in the, or Jesus in the New Testament, God in the Old Testament, and that, that, that there isn't really any cross-pollination there. Jesus is saying, all I've been saying is the same thing that God has always been saying because I am God and have always been. I haven't changed anything. We, of course, we reject outright the notion of God evolving along with time. But subconsciously, sometimes we do make the gospel a Jesus and New Testament thing and not anything to do with the Old Testament. But have you ever considered the salvation by grace in the Old Testament? The first offer of the gospel comes in Genesis 3.15. The first person to have statedly accepted the gospel, though we know there was more before Abraham, Genesis 15.6. And Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And when you take that verse and you break it down, wait, belief and righteousness are not the same thing. That's not an even exchange. So what is that? That's grace. You believe God and he gives you full righteousness? That's grace. And think about the sacrificial system. Is God, if he really is all-powerful, if he really is the creator, does he really need a pile of burned animal carcasses in a sacrificial system? Well, that bought me off. I really am just like a total barbaric, uh, brutalistic creature, and I love watching animals be slaughtered and burned. That makes me go, okay, I won't judge you now. He doesn't need that. It was his grace to accept that. Or think about the written word at all. You have a Bible, not just, hey, I'm going to save you out of Egypt. Now make me happy. Figure it out. No, he gives you a book. He says, here's exactly how to please me, exactly how to worship me in a way that I will, I promise I will receive it. The written word is grace. And think about just the book of Judges alone. Every single time Israel cries out, what does God do? Comes to their rescue, sends them a new judge, and then they have years of blessing until that judge dies, then they fall back down the tubes again, and then it starts all over. That's grace. Every time you call out in genuine repentance, I will respond. Grace in the Old Testament. And then we also kind of ignore harshness in the New Testament, don't we? Didn't Jesus come to say, Jesus say, I came to bring a sword and to divide families? And didn't, didn't uh, Jesus say to the Pharisees, woe to you, it's going to be worse for you in hell than it is going to be for Tyre and Sidon or for Sodom and for Gomorrah? And we just studied Acts 5, 1 through 11 in the men's Bible study, and that's when Ananias and Sapphira are struck dead for lying about their offering. Or the whole book of Revelation. At some point in the book of Revelation, there's going to be blood that's as deep as a horse's bridle. So we, we don't really, we're not fairly evaluating the Bible when we think Old Testament's kind of hard and distant and New Testament's mushy and close and warm. It's not really fair. Jesus is here to just obliterate that. He's going to have none of that attempt to divide God by verses 49 and 50. I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know what his commandment is, eternal life. 
eternal life. That's always been the Father's plan. That's the command. It's the message of eternal life. The source of the good news of the gospel that we know and that we embrace, of grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone, the source is God the Father, the Heavenly Father. Jesus didn't bring a new message of grace. He brought the same message of grace. And then he makes it actually effectual. And he ends all the sacrifices by being a sacrifice once for all. The book of Hebrews keeps repeating over and over. It's God's will. It's God's heart. It's God's plan. And it's never changed. So God the Father is the source, extending eternal life to rebellious sinners through his Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus' life, ministry, and death and resurrection was his idea, the Father's idea, the, the, the united Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was his idea. And he's always provided a way for means of atonement. Going back to Leviticus 16 with the day of atonement, the sacrifice of the two goats, to symbolize, look, here's the final one. And when John sees him in John 1.29, the Baptist says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the final one. God sent him. For us, bearing the good news from the Father. Because remember John 3, 16? Because God so loved the world, he sent Jesus. Not because Jesus so loved the world, which of course he did. But Jesus is ending and summarizing his ministry by saying, don't divide me from the Father. This is the consistent will of God from before the foundations of the world. It has always been this. What a button to put on your public ministry. What a way to summarize that and close that up. And then and you've summarized everything that you've said pu publicly. This is Jesus' summary to everything. This is the purpose of all of his miracles. Summarizes it perfectly. Now he's going to turn to his disciples, which we'll pick up with later. But let's not miss the message that Jesus could not not say about the last day, that there is one. The Bishop of Liverpool in 1800s, J.C. Ryle, a faithful evangelical minister he said this he said let us live like those who believe in the truth of judgment heaven and hell so living we shall be christians in deed and in truth and have boldness in the day of christ's appearing and he won't be ashamed when he comes back let the judgment day be the christian's answer and apology in his religion apology meaning reasoning for his faith irreligion or just rejecting the gospel may do tolerably well for a season, so long as a man is in health and prosperous and looks at nothing but this world. You can ignore God as long as those things are going well. But he who believes that he must give an account to the judge of the quick and the dead and his appearing in his kingdom will never be content with an ungodly life. He will say, there is a judgment and I can never serve God too much. Christ died for me. I can never do too much for him. What I want to leave us with, what I think Jesus is intending to leave us with, is are we living like all of this is real? Is this real? I mean, what we've been walking through for 12 chapters over many months and probably a year and a half or so, one day we're going to be confronted with this question, is this real? Reaching it, We know that chronologically, and he closed with it. Is it real? Is it real to us? Is it real to me? I was talking with Paul Rasmussen, and he has a friend who is facing uh, a dire cancer diagnosis. And as I was thinking about this, God just providentially worked that same illustration in, and his friend said to him and those that had gathered with him, I'm having to really face, is this real or not? This whole faith thing. This whole, that th th Jesus is the Son of God and that God is existing and eternally in three persons. He's created all these things. And is there a heaven and is there a hell? And now I'm on that deathbed, in a sense. He's not there oh, totally yet, but he still talks with Paul and says, is this real? Because now is the payoff. Now I'm at the end. Is it real? Did I give myself to the truth for 60 plus years? And the blessing of Paul's friend, a way, a way to encourage him, and then through him to me and then through, <laughs> through me to you, is that brother in Arkansas with that dire diagnosis is saying, it is real. And I did give myself to the truth for 60 years. Amen. Our only hope is in the gospel, and it's an invincible hope. 
To believe Christ is to believe the Father. Verse 44, to see Christ is to see the Father. Verse 45, and to hear Christ is to hear the Father. Verse 50. And what the Father does cannot be undone. And to trust in Christ and to re receive it, that is to place ourselves in the eternal guardianship of the one who rules the universe. It's to have the party that's offended by your egregious crimes go to the judge and say, I'm dropping all the charges and I'm going to take that one, him, I'm going to take her into my house and make them my children. That's the message beginning to end of the whole Bible. And that's what Jesus cries out as a, as a war cry, as birth pains, as a guttural from the depths of his being. That's what he cries out before he turns the public ministry off and turns and focuses on his disciples. That's what the whole world is meant to hear. And that's the message that we herald and shout every day. That's the message that we live every day. And that is truly amazing grace, is it not? Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we read your words uh, that you submitted yourself to be recorded by some ex-fisherman who heard what you said as you buttoned up your ministry publicly and wrote it down. And only you can, can concentrate down the essentials of what you said and what you came to do in that first advent so well. Where we are, we're stricken by the gravity of it and, and we're given a, an appropriate amount, amount of sobriety that while you are the God of all joy and that your mercy knows no bounds and your loving kindness endures forever, you don't, you don't pull back or dull the edge of the reality that we are sinners and you are the offended party and also the judge. And that that day will come. But that your message from Genesis 3.15, all those millennia ago, has always been grace. That you would grant us, that you would go to lengths, and put forth effort to die that the hero would die for all of the villains, not for the innocent ones, not for those being attacked by the villains, but for the villains themselves, so that on that day, all we might hear is, well done. And on that day, your son, very God of very God, would stand and advocate for us and claim us, and that you would then in turn honor us but this is all of grace and we are too often held too lightly in that understanding that you rest on us too inconsequentially because when we disregard your holiness and we disregard your justice your grace and your mercy just do not seem that important or that special it's just an offer from a kiosk that we can or can't accept, but if we don't, we'll be fine. Air it as it's supposed to be with your wrath and your justice and your holiness, your grace and your mercy. Drive us to our knees in humility and in gratitude. We can't help but respond. and We can't help but look out on those who are not in, in the fold, who are not in the flock, with just nothing but compassion and mercy, because we know you yanked us out against our will and brought us in. We're not better than those people out there. We weep for them as Christ wept for Jerusalem. And we go to them as Christ did. And we can see that all evangelism doesn't end in massive revivals because Jesus preaches these words to deaf ears and blind eyes. But nevertheless, you are faithful to draw those whom you have called to your son and we trust in that and we rest in that and we minister and we work and we are neighbors and we are little league team members and we are HOA board members with people knowing and believing that you are calling a people to yourself because you are the God of all grace and you always have been 
So may we move forward in that, in that great confidence that what you have done can never be undone. And what you have done is sealed our salvation by giving us the Holy Spirit and encouraging us day by day through the word. Lord, you are the God of all grace. We ask that you would bless us this week and that we would be effective, not producing results based on our schedule or based on our bare metrics, but effective. And we walk by faith and not by sight. We open our mouths and proclaim the grace of the gospel to all who would believe. We instill that in our children and we live as if this is all real. When we're so tempted and we're so discipled and catechized by the world away from that, that reality. Help us to force back against that, that this is all real. To not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we are blessed to know that you are doing that in us. That we work out our salvation with fear and trembling because you are working within. So Father, all we can do is say thanks. And we do now. And through Christ's name we do it. Amen.